All right. Happy to connect with you, Elliot Hulse. I've been, I've been watching your videos for a long time, so it's uh, cool for me. Yeah, same here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like I said, I, I've been watching your videos for a while. I did a lot a few years ago. And you came back on my radar because I was speaking to another podcast guest about red pill stuff. And he was like, oh, Elliot Hulse is talking about red pill stuff a lot, too. And I was like, really? Um, so I want to speak to you about that, among other things. But I'm curious because uh, you're very different than most guys I know who get into red pill. Like, from what I understand, you've been married happily for a long time. You haven't been a beta male any time recently. It's like, how did you get interested in this topic? My fans. I'm okay. A coach making youtube videos uh, in order to help men become strong again i mean that's what mm -hmm. i do i make men strong and so my my strength training youtube videos caught on and then i started giving life advice and that caught on and so through my life advice channel young men were asking uh elliot what do you think about migtow and mm -hmm. uh and no fat and so these were these were new to me i didn't really research or was interested in those things you know uh just didn't wasn't part of my life but when I looked into them and then I was introduced to the rational male a book written by one of the guys in the I guess mm -hmm. what they call the manosphere community Rolo Tomasi uh I became red-pilled <laughs> I became waking up you know my life is well established but because I I help men grow stronger uh it's good for me to keep broadening my horizon and knowing what's going on in in their lives and so uh when i found red pill i was like oh well this is a pill that my boys need my guys need to know about this stuff hmm. yeah so uh you know so i found a lot of value in the red pill i recommend rational mail to a lot of people there's a couple mm -hmm. things in that in MGTOW which i feel counter what i think are some virtues that maybe you talk about taking responsibility and like yeah. i'm not blaming which i do hear not from everyone but it's pretty common in like MGTOW red pill discussions that you're blaming the feminine imperative and i was curious what you thought about that of like taking ownership versus a lot of the theorizing about why things are not right for men yeah there's a lot of that going on and um i i recognize that within every community no matter what it is what it is that you're doing you're going to have different ways of thinking. You're going to have different people that have different experiences that have different emotions about it. You know, I, I can't tell a guy who's been, you know, screwed over in divorce law uh, in the courts uh, how to think and behave with regard to that, but I can offer a perspective. And so what I think I also, besides being able to bring the red pill to my community, I think I bring a little, I bring a different perspective to the red pill community. I have a traditional marriage. Uh, and I have children and uh, I'm still a mentor to men. And I think that my experiences can show them the light out of the darkness, you know, the light out, how it, the, the awareness of intersexual dynamics doesn't have to stop you from enjoying a traditional lifestyle. You know, MGTOW is okay. I think MGTOW is all right. I think it's, I think it's a good idea for men to go their own way uh, for a period of time or for their whole life. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, so I'm just offering a perspective. Gotcha. Okay. Don't you feel like uh, perhaps if a guy goes his own way for a long period of time, his whole life, maybe he's avoiding certain challenges that maybe are presented by e either women or the feminized world? Yeah, and he'll face different challenges. He'll, he'll face other challenges. I don't think everybody needs to take on every beast. Mm -hmm. And women and the feminized world and civilization is one beast that you can choose to tackle if you are called to it. But I don't think every man is called to it. A lot of us are unconscious and we walk and we stumble into it. And then the next thing you know, they're like, you know, what the hell am I doing here? They wake up and they're like, this woman, I don't love this woman. This woman doesn't love me. Uh, and this, this wasn't the right choice, but it's because it was unconscious and it was kind of Disney-fied into us. So a lot of men are not aware that there's an option. You, you don't have to become a householder and a, and a, and a husband and a, and a father if you don't want to. And I think more than anything, I hope to just encourage men that don't feel called to it, not to feel pressure to deal with women. If you don't want to deal with women, then you'll have a lot more energy to attack other beasts in your life. You think about 
Like Nikola Tesla is a famous n- MGTOW. He's a guy that chose not to deal with women. <laughs> and I think that's amazing. I don't think he would be Nikola Tesla, Nikola Tesla if he had a girlfriend or a woman and children. <laughs> so it's cool. Yeah. It reminds me, I guess, uh, I know you have a video on sex transmutation. I think that's how I found you a long time ago. And like, mm-hmm. that's kind of like the old, um, old religious way to not get your sexual energy distracted. It's just not have sex with women and just focus on God or your work or something. Um, yeah, monks did that for religion and entrepreneurs do it for business. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a proponent of no, no fap then? Uh, I say that again? You're a proponent of no fap then? In order for me to experience, see, the whole thing is I can theorize, but I need to experience. And I don't, I don't masturbate because I'm married. So mm-hmm. for me, it was a matter of putting sex into perspective in my marriage. And in order to do that, I did some fe- sex fasting. So, you know, there were some times where I was food fasting also, too. I learned a lot about myself that way. Um, but I let my wife know that, you know, we won't be having sex for a period of time or, you know, we abstained. And that... More than anything, you know, the sex transmutation and, um, you know, semen retention that's associated with it physiologically is helpful. But for me, it also helped me gain a perspective on where sex fits as a conscious or an unconscious urge within, within men, within myself. And then I started to see it better within men. And I began to realize how much of an addiction sex is and can be, whether it be you're jerking off to uh, pornography or you're addicted to sex with your wife or your woman, which I think can really happen there, which may be just as or more insidious because when you're addicted to sex and you're needing it from a woman, it's no better than a, a drug dealer. The woman's a drug dealer and, uh, and a drug addict. And you start needing that person. You start, you know, the many, when most men oftentimes uh, will give their power away to women for the, for the vagina. You know, they don't want to stir the boat. They don't want to, they don't want to steer the boat. That's really what it is. That's how women have gained a tremendous amount of power manipulatively through men is with sex. You know, if you do, you don't do what I tell you to do, you don't be a beta male and let me push you around. Well, you ain't going to get any vagina. You know, we're not going to have sex. And so uh, it's, it's subtle power. And if we can distance ourselves from the neediness of it, we get back quite a bit of power. Yeah, it's kind of like the root of nice guy syndrome, like needing validation, but specifically pussy validation, which is what most guys are seeking or even driving them to succeed in some covert way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, has, I mean, I know you got into it because of your, of your followers, your students. Uh, has it affected your life, as, as, especially as a husband and father? This red pill stuff, this other things you've been delving into? Oh, yeah. Like I said, you know, I had to, I had to face... Uh, sex in in my life and in my marriage. I had to take a look at it. You know, I was unconscious about it. You know, we have sex. We've been having sex since we were 14 years old. I've been dating my wife since we were kids, since we were teenagers. So uh, never was there ever, I never put it, I never objectified sex. It was just, it's what, it was a part of our relationship and it has been forever. So Red Pill and MGTOW and, uh, and, and NoFap, particularly it was NoFap, got me to say, hmm, wait a second, do, maybe I, maybe I'm, maybe I should take a break from sex. Maybe I should create some perspective, some distance here so that I can see myself better, see where sex is in a relationship and see my wife better for who she is. Because when we're having sex and we have on the, those emotional goggles that are associated with needing the woman and needing her sex, um, you, oftentimes we don't see red flags, you know, and uh, we don't see her with, with proper eyes, with, with our true eyes. So a lot of what we think is love, you know, we think we're in love is actually lust. I, I need her and you, your mouth, your water, your, your waters and you, you're always, you're horny. Um, when you take that out of the equation and for me and, and what I'm suggesting for young men is you can now look at that woman and deal with her logically. Is she a good choice for me in my life? Is she, will she make a good wife? Is she the type of woman that I can create a family with? Can I build a future with her? My wife now not only has been an incredible mother, but she works for me. She, she does work in my business. Is she, does she have those kind of skills? The same way you would, 
take on a business partner, you want to take on your woman. She's got to add something. There's got to be some value there. My dad would say, you don't need a useless woman. So it's like, well, sex is a really basic use. Like every woman has a warm hole. What beyond that? And, and even looks like looks fade, especially for women. I, I was so, it was so fun to learn about the sexual market value and sec- and, and how men, their sexual market value peaks at like 35 and women's peaks at like 25. <laughs> and so to know like, okay, look, she's not going to look like this forever. What else is there that she will be able to offer to me as we build this life into the next, you know, four, five, six centuries? Well, I think we just froze. Got you back. Are oh, you back? Okay. Awesome. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about, uh, you've been with her since you were teenagers. Like, uh, what's mm-hmm. that been like? I know this is a really general question, but what's that been like being with someone from childhood? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm a man of many interests. I'm very promiscuous. <laughs> That's why, you know, people know me as a strength coach, but then I just watched some video. Some guy was cursing me out saying that I was, a, I was I'm the shaman of bullshit. And so... <laughs> I also have many other aspects of myself. And so I like to explore and it keeps me, it keeps me busy, but it also keeps me a little ungrounded. And I, you know, I, but I enjoy that. And I, I appreciate that about myself. That's what I'm here doing and dealing with. Um, had I had that kind of attention deficit disorder and promiscuity with women, <laughs> I think my life would be pretty miserable right now because I would be one of the guys that are in MGTOW because that bitch got me and I probably have lots of them, you know? So uh, I remember like falling in love with a different girl every week in middle school. So the fact that I met my one woman so early really allowed me to focus and concentrate my energy in very productive. It was like sex transmutation for me in a way, because I wasn't spreading my, I wasn't spreading my seed, my energy out, but I wasn't spreading my, uh, you know, that energy that's required to attract women and to, and to uh, be validated by women. I didn't need any of that shit. I had, yeah. I had a woman. So I was able to excel in football. I was able to excel in strength training. I was able to excel in my career and then into my business. So having one woman kept me on a one-track mind. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, so I turned 30 recently and I've kind of gone through this life shift where I've been pretty promiscuous through my 20s. But a lot of the guys I look up to are kind of preaching what you're saying, like it gives you a simplicity and groundedness and focus into your life purpose when you're not spreading your attention in the dating world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I guess you can't be promiscuous with everything is what you're saying. Well, <laughs> especially with your sex energy. Yeah. Hmm. So what got you into, uh, you're the only guy maybe I, I know probably maybe on the internet who's speaking about both something as concrete and material as strength training and also mm-hmm. a lot of energetic topics, the sex transmutation and you have a thing on grounding. Mm-hmm. Did that, where did that interest come from? Was that like a childhood thing or did you have a mentor or was it a book? Well, I've always been into self-exploration since the time I was a kid. I'm, my parents are from Belize. And in Belize, there's a lot of uh, multiculturalism. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, race mixing. So I, I'm, I think I'm about like three quarters white and European and like a quarter African. Uh, my family's all mixed up like that. So uh, one of the questions that was posed to me often as a kid was, Who, what are you, Elliot? What are you? <laughs> and, you know, so that, it wasn't as easy for me to answer that as a, for a lot of kids. You know, I'm white. What the fuck are you asking me for? or I'm black. And then, you know, as we got older and we started differentiating ourselves even more, there were Haitians and there were Jamaicans and there were Irish and there were Italians and there were Jews. So um, for me, it was like, hmm, what am I? And that, I think that unconsciously that question buried a seed in me. And when I remember being in middle school and being in the library and I came across the philosophy section and there was a book called, uh, Who Are You Really? By uh, Apollo May a philosopher and a metaphysicist and a, and a um, quantum physicist, a scientist. And so that kind of opened my mind to the fact that there's way more going on than just this 
flesh and the, and the carnal and sensual and physical experience of life. And so that sent me down the rabbit hole. And I was attracted to the work of Alan Watts when I was like, when I was in, I guess that would be like 1997, like graduating high school, me and my brother, when there was Napster, we download Alan Watts uh, audios and listen to those. And it exposed me to uh, Eastern thought and Eastern religion, Buddhism and uh, Taoism. And so that, that opened me up, I guess you would say, to exploring the energetic, the, the soul, really, the, the, the energetic connection or the continuum between the physical world and the metaphysical world, our physical experience and our metaphysical experience. And so as a strength coach, I'm very physical. It's all about physical strength. You know, that's what I've been my whole life. I played football. I was a professional strongman. But then I also have this deeply spiritual side and this understanding and this yearning. And so I've always been very religious in that way. Uh, and then to see that there were and still are geniuses like Wilhelm Reich, who, at least in the West, because in the East, they knew a lot of this stuff, like with the chakra system. But Wilhelm Reich was a psychologist that was a, uh, a student, a psychoanalyst, student of, of Sigmund Freud, who began to notice how the psychological predispositions and disturbances within an individual embodied themselves in their muscular system. Mm -hmm. And they, and there were breathing interruptions, you know, the, the, what he called the orgastic wave, the ability to breathe deeply through this natural wave in the body. Um, and that was usually a result of neurotic holding patterns, muscular tension that we create from our psychological stress and trauma. So it's like, when I began here and I explored here and then I started to see the gap being filled with brilliant people and ancient ideas like the chakra system and, and, and Qigong and things like that. I, was, I just realized like, this is the spectrum that we're living on. This is the spiral that we're living on. We're all, we're all of this. And if I want to be the strongest version of myself, I want to know myself and be my best. And I'm going to, and I'm a teacher, a guru, a bullshit, <laughs> like the guy said, <laughs> uh, of teaching ideas that are expansive, you know, people, it's, it's expansive ideas, then, uh, then I'm gonna play along that whole spectrum. I'm gonna play with all of it. So let's lift like beasts, breathe deep, and atone with the Father. Can you speak a little bit about grounding? Because it's, it's one, I know you have a ground, one of my friends actually just took your grounding course, I think last year, he said he had a lot of good things to say. But it's one of those topics that is kind of energetic, spiritual, but it's one of those things that everybody knows what you're talking about. And, but it's hard to describe, too. So I'm curious on your, your, how you describe it, how you teach it, what's your take on it? Well, if you're talking about grounding as, a, um, as an experience, right? I would, I would call bioenergetic grounding. Uh, it is being fully present throughout the spectrum. Right? If our spectrum goes like this, spirit, mind, emotion, body, right? And I do this, but it's really more like this. It's more like a circle. But if we're spirit, mind, emotion, and body, then a grounding would be, an, if we do it this way too, you know, spirit, high, physical, low. This would make more sense as an analogy. If you think of that, the physical body ex extending itself up as an antenna, we want to be as free as we can through, through all of this so that spirit grounds itself. Spirit embodies itself in its purest form possible, because we live in 3D, in the physical form. Uh, some people would call that your Christed self or your risen self, right? Think about it, your risen self. You're, you're, you're free along that full spectrum. You don't have any karma or any interruptions, mental baggage, emotional baggage, physical distortions as a result. It's grounded spirit i mean this might be the obvious question but how does one recognize their blockages or or start like maybe a guy recognizes okay i'm really ungrounded maybe in these situations or in life what do i do well consider the spectrum mm -hmm. spirit is pure spirit is pure energy there's there's it's not incarnate at all. It's completely intangible. It doesn't, have, it doesn't have any karma. It doesn't have any density. It has no frequency. Or, it has a frequency, but it's a high frequency. 
thought is when incarnation begins. And so if we're going to move down the spectrum, clearing ourselves, the first place to begin is to is clear thought. And a practice that's associated with retaining clear thought would be like stillness, silent prayer, meditation. Do you see? So mindfulness. And so, you know, a lot of my videos for many years have been about, you know, just confronting our thoughts, questioning our thoughts, not allowing demonic thoughts to interrupt our flow. Guilt, shame, anger, discordant thoughts. So we, we begin because that is like the seed. The thought is seed. But thought as a seed has to be planted in soil to bear fruit. And so the thought seed, it's, it's interesting too, the thought seed grounds itself into the heart, you see? Mm -hmm. So the heart is what represents the emotion. And so a thought becomes incarnate because it's a thought, but embodies itself by how we feel about the thought. So be aware of and work with the emotional body by, and, and you, can, you can help the mindset even, it, it all works together, that's why I said it's a circle. Uh, you could help the mindset shift by, by feeling good, choosing to feel good. And you could soothe discordant thoughts by going to emptiness or perfect peace in feeling. So feeling and the body, so if we move deeper down to the balls, is when I say breathing to your balls, I'm talking about mm -hmm. breathing, baby, the whole mm -hmm. of it. Uh, the emotion is in between. If you look at it in between thought and between embodiment, balls, is the heart, is thought. It carries an element of both. It's both tangible, because you can feel a feeling. That's why it's called a fucking feeling. Right. But it's also softer than the body. The body is dense. The body is, is subject to time and space. Emotion is a little bit, and that's why uh, Abraham Hicks calls your emotion your emotional guidance system because when you feel, you sense what is going on archetypally, what's going on in the spirit realm, what's going on in your, in your thoughts. Sometimes our thoughts are so unconscious. Most people's thoughts, especially the negative, automatic negative thoughts are so unconscious that they don't even know that they're thinking them, but they feel shitty all the time. So when you're, when you're depressed or when you're anxious, you just don't feel your best, that's the, the sensation of discordant thought in your, in your physical body. Discordant thought manifests as, as, as the feeling of discord within the body begins to further ground itself through the nervous system into the muscular system because it's all one thing. The brain, it's the muscle system. Armor. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's when it starts embodying itself. And that's where breathing starts to become stifled and suffer. It's interesting that the word breathing comes from the word spirit, which is where we get inspire. And to inspire is to draw the spirit down fully, to, to take it in. Uh, and so our breathing suffers. And uh, the breathing suffers as an as a, as a unconscious defense mechanism that we do. We're, it's a doing now. It's physical. It's a doing um, by tensing parts of our body, be it the throat, the chest, solar plexus. I carry a lot of tension in my solar plexus and throat. A lot of people across the eyes, the ocular segment, mm -hmm. down into the pelvic floor. A lot of tension, uh, which holds back. This is where a lot of our physical, this is where our root is. Our physical root is down here into our sexuality. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, that's where our energy rises up. So to cut off sensation, we, we tighten and, and uh, have dysfunction. Dis even digestive dysfunction is associated with it. Uh, within the in the pelvic floor and the sex center. And that's why when I say breathing to your balls, I'm talking physical also too. You know, relaxing the pelvic floor and being able to feel into your roots. Mm -hmm. So would you say sex transmutation is kind of like sending it the other way? Like you have the feeling down there, the lower centers, your arousal, your sex energy, your pleasure, and you're bringing it up through your emotions to connect the spirit? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. So you mentioned archetypal, and I actually wanted to ask you about the masculine archetype, because it's another one of these kind of vague 
it could be abstract topics, but it's more pertinent now than ever. Red Pill touches on it a lot of, I mean, it's hard for boys to grow up into men right now. There's a lot of confused younger men. Yeah. And the masculine archetype is something that used to, I think, be universally understood. And now it's kind of being watered and confused. How do you, what's your take on the masculine archetype and how do you get guys or help guys reconnect to their version of it? Well, I'll begin by saying uh, I'm, a I'm a big fan of Carl Jung also. And if you d decide to, to study the spectrum of the things I'm talking about, Carl Jung is spiritual, archetypal, patterns, mystical. This is, and he was a student of, of uh, Sigmund Freud also. It's interesting, Freud. He had this really mystical student who was also outcast. And he also had this very physical student, uh, Wilhelm Reich, who's all, who was outcast. Wilhelm Reich talked about sex and physicality. Carl Jung talked about archetypal energy. Archetype means pattern. Interesting that the word pattern is where we get the word paternity, which is where we use the word father. And that's why father is referred to as above. The, the archetypal world is the world of the father, um, world of patterns. And so uh, he had a student by the name of uh, Robert Moore, PhD, uh, rest in peace, uh, who took Jung's concept of the quadrated psyche. Jung, Jung believed that the, 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 the collective unconscious, the psyche, the numinous God, was broken down into four, right? Think of a cross. Mm -hmm. And he said that it was a quadrated, there was a quadrated phenomenon to it, this cross-like phenomenon where there are four quarters. Remember before I spoke about spiritual, uh, mental, emotional, physical? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, they, they relate. Thinking, feeling, being, doing. They relate. And so uh, his student, Robert Moore, was very prominent in the early stages of the men's movement. And uh, he spoke about these four quarters with mythological terms. Uh, myth is also an archetype. Religion is an archetype. These stories, they, they feed our soul. And there are recurring themes that associate each one of these four quadrants with a king, a warrior, a magician, and a lover aspect of the masculine consciousness of the, of the, of the did Robert Moore write that book? I know there's a book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Correct. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. That's, that's Robert Moore. And so what we're wanting as men is to have a fully integrated masculine psyche. We want to, we want to fully integrate our inner King, warrior, magician, and lover. And so what we look for as men, okay, another archetype, I'm going to kind of, I'm going on tangents here, so yeah. I, you're, you're a great interviewer, you're letting me just ramble, so go, <laughs> I'm going to go. Yeah. So, so given that and knowing that and, and going back to your question about, you know, men being lost and, and needing something, we're talking about the archetypal world, but archetypal, what's happening in the archetypal world and in the imaginary world and the mythological world and the, in the psyche needs to be grounded because we live here. We, ha we, have, we have bodies. Knowing this, our ancestors also offered a process, an, init a, a, an archetype, meaning that it's cross-cultural and it shows up in, in patterns in all cultures and you can't get rid of it. We even do it here, but we do it in a very uh, unconscious and uh, unresourceful way. But there's this process of initiation when there are shifts in our consciousness, when the, the, the ego, which is made up of those four archetypes, there's a construct, say like, you know, you grow up and you've got a lot of mama's boy in you. You're a lot of lover, not much warrior. Your king can't stand on its own and you're way up in your head. So there's a lot of magician there. You see what I'm saying? So there's, a, there's an ego construct. And in various stages of our life, the ego construct is, a, is, a, is appropriate for what we're experiencing physically. And then there are stages in our life that, that need to be destroyed and rebuilt. Our, 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 our sense of self uh, has to be destroyed. Our ego has to be de destroyed and rebuilt. And so it requires like a, it requires a dance. It requires work that goes on between the archetypal world and the physical world and how to incarnate the perfect, the, per the, the now perfect ex uh, incarnation or ego that's associated with the new phase that's going on in my life. 
So we, want, we need to re-perfect ourselves. And if we could do it consciously, and the world around us is aware of what's going on, we transition to the, into these next phases uh, successfully. And so these phases happen every 12 years. And so what our ancestors would do with boys, because we're talking about boys again, we're talking about men and, uh, and, and you know, linking the archetypal world, the pattern world, the world of the father to, um, to physical experience. The initiation process that the, the elders, the fathers, the grandfathers, the mothers, the great grandmothers, uh, all understood was, it was necessary for a boy to become a man. It was critical. For girls, it was a little bit different, and they have their initiation also, which is more physical. Um, but for a boy, it needed to be shown to him. We're, we're a little different in this way. And he, it needs to be experienced. That's how boys learn. We learn by doing. There were a series of required steps for physical steps and, and a drama to ensue in order to, to help this young man be reborn into his new, stronger, uh, vital, irresponsible self. It would begin with a separation from the world of the mother. Separation from society. So they would, they would take the boy out of the society. He's got to get out of here. He can't be here where he's starting to feel his oats. He's got his, the comfort of his mommy. He's got the comfort of society. He's got the comfort of food. He needs to be broken down, basically, taken away and broken down, shown uh, humility. Humility comes from being humiliated oftentimes. That's why rites of passage is often, when they're pseudo in our society, it's like, you know, drink until you, until you pass out, like uh, with uh, these guys in um, Sorari for fraternities, hazing. Um, but they did, they were very physical in the, in the, in the humiliation. And I use that word resourcefully, uh, humiliation, because it's the, it's the humbling, the breaking down of the ego that allows someone one to rise back up. So they would do things with this young man, like fasting. Fasting was always a part of it. You know, now you don't get to eat for the next four days mm -hmm. as you go through this, uh, this austerity. And so some, some of the, some of what the men would uh, implement to support the young man in this breakdown and build up initiation process would be like tattooing, you know, they would tattoo the whole side of their body or, you know, there are different things like this, like hunting, you know, you'd have to go and catch an animal or something, you, or they would have these elaborate process, these elaborate uh, feats of courage where maybe they jump from a tall tree with a bungee, they go like bungee jumping, like all kinds of shit, just to, to test their mettle. And to, and, to, and, to, and to break the mama boy baby addictions that they had when they were you know, still beta and blue-pilled as a, as, as a baby boy. So there was separation from the mother. There was a ritual, there was a ritual initiation, rites of passage process. And then there was this third part that allowed the boy to be reintegrated into society that had lots to do with reconstituating a proper relationship to the archetypal world, the father world. It's what they would call atonement with the father. And so this, this required that the older men instill in the, in the young man who's, who's going to be reintroduced back into this society, meaning and purpose and vision and a sense of dignity and responsibility to the men to the civilization, the tribe, but also to the fathers who have passed, the great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers, the fathers up in the sky, the, the spiritual fathers, our ancestors that, would, that would, we would still, we're, we're still connected to. And this is why in like the Lion King, the Rafiki takes the, the young lion up to the mountain and he, he shows him, you know, he says, um, look up in the sky and you'll see your, your father and, and the, you know, the, the stars came together and, you know, the father was talking down to the young lion. And so the point was that there's this connection to the eternal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I just had Robert Glover on the podcast who wrote Norm Mr. Nice Guy. And we're speaking about this basically oh. how like a beta male, for instance, didn't have that rite of passage. So he's basically still a 12 year old in his psyche. 
Like he never got to be a man because he never took on a challenge where older men showed him what's up basically and that humiliation you're talking about. So like for a guy who maybe is an adult now, 20s, 30s, 40s, recognizes he missed out on this initiation that was in his instincts at puberty. How does he seek out his challenges if he's living a comfortable first world life? Well, you're being initiated by life. The thing is with men now, we don't have mentorship. We don't have, we don't have me- not to say that we don't have mentorship, but, we, uh, but most men don't know what I'm talking about this archetype of initiation and what's required and how our ancestors did it. So the rites of passage initiation process for men no longer really exists, but men are being initiated in different ways, either be it through a, uh, a chosen experience, like being a part of a sports team, um, joining the military, joining a gang. I spoke to a man re- uh, th- last weekend who his initiation happened in prison. And so they're, they're going through this ego breakdown and rebuilding process, but it's happening in a haphazard way. And not everybody get, comes out on the other side successful because they don't have perspective. That there's no strong meaning. There's nothing to attach their, their new life to. And so just to make that point that it's happening anyway, every, it's interesting because I have more young men at the age of 24 that follow me than any others. Because like I said, every 12 years, and so I know I went through a big shift between the ages of 12 and 24. Same thing with men that, for myself and the young men that follow me between 24 and 27. There's almost like a, there's a complete, there's a crisis. Let me put it that way. And we have to face parts of ourselves that no longer fit. And we got to rebuild ourselves in, a, in an image and in a, and in a way that's resourceful for the next chapter in our lives. So it's happening. What I aim to do what my purpose and mission is with grounding camp is to bring back the ritual initiation process and create for each individual that goes through the process, each man that goes through the process, a sense of meaning once they go back into life in their new integrated, reintegrated way. So what I'm saying is that I see and I'm forerunning this re-emergence of the acknowledgement and of the practice of formal ritual initiation for men. Mm. Do you have a son, right? I do. I, how does this affect your parenting? Is this something you construct or will construct for him? Uh, I, I'd, I'd imagine I'm a lot of for, is- <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it for hundreds of thousands so far. I've had uh, eight grounding camps, so I've had close to a thousand people go through my grounding camps. I'm wow. I'm it. He was born, he was born to the shaman. Gotcha. <laughs> so, there's not much that, you know, it's going to happen either in the home or I'm going to take him to grounding camp. But I've taken both of my daughters, all three, you know, two of my oldest daughters to grounding camp. I don't do it for women anymore. I don't allow women in there. But, uh, but I keep my family very closely associated with the work that I do. Hmm. Now, what was the reason to stop allowing women? Because I recognize this need for separation. For men, like I said, this, the, the archetype of initiation begins with separation. He can't be there with his mommy. He can't be there. When men, and this is when I began to notice it, I knew this, but I, but I went against my instinct, and I was like, I'm going to invite women. I'm going let to this, let this happen. And uh, Men are different. Men are distracted. Men are not honest when women are around. And when women are there they manipulate. This is what they do. They do it in every organization. They do it in, in the church. I'm hearing so many stories about the churches and how feminized they've become. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not th- that it's wrong. It's, it's, it's their nature and it's okay. But as men, we create boundaries. We say no. And so I needed to, in order to preserve this, this, uh, this necessary process for, for men and for what I came here to do, I had to stop having women come. Hmm. I gotcha. Uh, so it sounds like, uh, as far as like your son goes, uh, he's in the field already. Um, but do you have advice for young dads or whatever fathers in general, maybe don't have that framework, but want to bring out the, or like evoke the masculine archetype in their sons? Well, one thing to consider is that, you know, before the age of 12, there's, they're boys. 
they're little boys. <laughs> they're uh, one author calls them pages, I think. And so their whole life is about adventure. And so when he's young, uh, he wants adventure. He wants to go camping. He wants to do risky things. You know, my son likes to climb on top of a, of a brick. They, they got this climbing wall at the park. He likes to climb to the top and look at me and like get my approval and then jump off and then do it again. You know, little things like this that make them uh, feel like superheroes because that's really mm -hmm. what they want. They look up to, if you notice what boy, little boys watch, it's superheroes. They're into superheroes. And there's a good reason because they're, they're, they have that in them and they want to emulate it and it's good. So you create op opportunities for them to, to do just daddy and boy things. Go be, bo go be boys with your little boy. You know what I'm saying? But then when age 12, 13, 14, starts rolling around, you know, I began initiating men way before I knew I was because at the age of 14, I started weight training. And when I started Strength Camp, which is my other business, you see, I run the Spectrum. Uh, strength Camp, uh, I, I was turning boys into men through weight training in the same way that I was. And so I would invite fathers to start exercising with your son. Start, get into physical training. Men learn by doing. So if you're not on a farm like we are, most of us aren't on farms like we used to be. It's a shame that everything has been so automated and outsourced that, it, that a world... In this world, men need to do. We need jobs. We need a purpose. We need a mission. We need something to, to engage in daily. We need a craft uh, that you can teach your son something. I say exercise. That's, that's what it's been for me. Teach him, learn, take your, go to a martial arts class with your son or, um, or start taking up weight training. I think that's the best way, really. Take up weight training, teach your son how to lift. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's because like uh, was coming out in that, the last uh, interview I did a lot is uh, that the, the most, the best thing that parents can do is to get their shit together and be secure because that's what's going to affect, like that's what comes out in therapy. If you have an insecure parent, that's what messes you up and distracts you, gives you your nice guy syndrome or anything. So a lot of it seems to be like getting down to the fundamentals ultimately. Yeah, be the strongest version of yourself. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so I'm curious about your past too, because I'm trying to piece together your story. Um, how did the YouTube thing start from, I guess you were a strong man and then got into just sharing ideas? Well, I was a, an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I started strength camp training athletes and men out of the back of my van. Um, I knew I wanted to be a personal trainer because my uncle was a personal trainer back in like 1997 before it was a real thing. And I admired the fact that he got to do work that he loved, which is to teach people how to get stronger. And, uh, and he worked for himself. I knew that's exactly what I was going to do. And so I started Strength Camp in 2007, training men in the park way before boot camps were like a big thing. And I called it Strength Camp because I was having them, I was a strong man at the time. I was getting involved in strong man, the sport. And so I'd have guys carry sandbags and, and drag sleds and, and, I'd, I'd bring barbells out to the freaking park and have them training with barbells. And as, as a means for helping spread strength camp, I wanted them to bring more clients and bring their friends and referrals. I started making videos, YouTube videos with a flip cam of our workouts. YouTube was brand new. YouTube started like just a few months before I started strength camp and started making the videos. And um, I also was a digital marketer. I started learning. I learned, I built, I learned a lot of things really quickly. I learned how to build websites around that time, which helped me build my business. And I also learned about information marketing. This was back in like 2005, 2006. I, I'm learning how to build websites and, and I'm learning information marketing. And so when I started to realize that people worldwide were watching my YouTube videos, the ones I was putting up just for my members, I didn't, I, I wasn't cognizant to the fact that people worldwide would be watching it and it would ever mean anything. I wasn't conscious. Uh, but when I started to recognize it, I realized, number one, oh, I've got more leads to sell my eBooks to. I had a football product and I had a, a straw man training product. I have more leads to sell my products to. And in 2013, I discovered that <laughs> YouTube actually pays you to make a lot of videos. I didn't, I wasn't like paying attention to that, to, to, you know, being a YouTuber and making money until the Hodge twins hit me up one day. And everyone knows the Hodge twins, they're in the fitness industry. They're guys that look almost like me and they're comedians. And they're like, Hey dude, why don't you, why aren't you 
turning on your ads and making YouTube money. I was like, I don't know. I, I sell eBooks and I have a gym. And so when I turned that on <laughs> and my income basically doubled because back then YouTube paid pretty well, uh, I started cranking out videos and I made like so upwards to two, three videos a day sometimes. And they caught on people liked them. And then I exploded in that way. I had millions of subscribers. Yeah, because you have a unique style, or at least uh, your older videos had a unique style of you kind of like yelling at the camera in your gym. Was that like planned or that just like you just had the impulse and that's what happened? That's just me, bro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's just me. I turn on the fucking camera. And here's the thing. I, I see all these videos now and they're really polished and people take a lot of time to edit them and put up special graphics and you can tell that they're script and they've got, you know, a plan. And uh, they, I did a little bit of that. But all my success came from just being me, just spontaneous. Somebody asked me a question, I'd read the question and I'd just say whatever the fuck was on my mind. And, uh, and that, was, that was my style. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at some of your older stuff and like everything's shaky and like it's just raw. Like clearly no production value, <laughs> but it's like the content is just so pure. I guess that's what, that's what, uh, that's what caught on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so has, uh, this might be another abstract question, but with all the personal development you've discovered over the years since 2007, has that changed how you work out? Because I know you tie them together in a lot of your videos. Well, given everything I've said, you'll understand when I say that the body is the mind and what's happening physically is happening metaphysically. It's all one thing. Uh, I started suffering injuries. Mm -hmm. I'm a wounded man. <laughs> I've, got, I've got inner beta issues. They needed to be dealt with. And so uh, in order to get my attention, God started chopping me up physically. I tore both biceps, tore my Achilles tendon, uh, had a hernia, uh, fell on my head and had a neck injury. <laughs> so, you know, I talk about that ego deconstruction process. Well, for me, it was very physical because I'm a physical guy. People know me for being strong and physical. So uh, that's where a lot of my learning an experience came from and it required me to humble myself in terms of how I use my body. You know, it's all one thing. So there was a period there where I was doing only yoga. I did only yoga for a long time. I was a 249 pound professional straw man. That was huge. If you see some of my videos, right. And, and 90% of my career, 99% of my career, if you consider football, um, I was drug free. I just got good genetics. I can build my body up. And there was a, there was a stint between 2000, uh, like the end of 2009, where I used steroids for about four months, four to six months. And I just got swole as fuck. I was already a professional strong man, but I ballooned up and I didn't look good. You want to know which is the steroid Elliot? It's the one where I just look round. <laughs> yeah. What was the reason you decided to take it? Was it to get over injuries? No. It was to win, win more, gotcha. keep going. I'm a beast. And so I was already a pro straw man. And, uh, and I just was curious, I, you know, I like to experiment. I can't be having opinions about shit if I don't experiment. And so I used it and man, I, and it was, it works almost too good. And that's, you know, where I ended up tearing my first bicep. Mm. And so I, you know, I treated my body that extreme. I've been that extreme. I'm an extremist. And so if I go extreme one way, I go extreme the other way as an extremist. And so I went extreme in terms of yoga. And for you know, a few years, I, just did, I did mostly yoga, did yoga. And then uh, this past year, I've been back to strength training, barbell, dumbbell training. So it's been, it's been a lot of different things on the journey. Did you notice uh, any negative things when you got off steroids? Like your body wasn't producing testosterone at the same level? That's, a, that's one of the things you hear a lot. No, because unlike a lot of the, the guys that are talking about it on YouTube, I, did, I didn't make a career out of it. Yeah. I know guys that like, they can't get off because if they get off, they're gonna turn into a woman. And so I, only, I used it for a short period of time. I didn't use it for very long at all. So it was like, I was who I was. I blew up. It was so funny because it was literally like me, me, pop, me again. You see what I'm saying? So like I was normal and then I swole, popped my bicep. And I was like, all right, I'm done with this shit. So I didn't have any, 
I, I learned my lesson with the top bicep. And then mm. I was like, all right, I'm done. And then, uh, so my, I didn't really suffer. So is it, I mean, I'm saying, going off what you're saying, the changes have basically been not pushing yourself to your max. Is that what's changed in your workouts? That's not necessarily the case. I'm still an extremist and I okay. will, and I like to do that. Um, it's not even a conscious change. What I'm offering is a, a perspective. Listen to your body. Where are you? And what is your body asking of you? And so it was for me. What is my body asking of me? When, and, you know, when I say body, look, <laughs> it's not all pure. Like I told you, I got demons too. So my body was asking me to, to push it for strong, man. I was just listening. I was listening to my soul's calling. I'm a fucking beast. I always have access to the best. There was no telling me otherwise. I, I couldn't hear it. So I was listening to my body. I was listening to my soul. I was going with it full bore. And then when the injuries came, it was, I, 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 my ego wasn't so strong. This is where it's like this, this flexibility of being able to die and be reborn um, consciously is helpful. I knew when I popped my bicep doing straw man that it was like, okay, time to take a different approach. Okay, no big deal. I quit. I, didn't, I wasn't a straw man anymore. And I started taking a new approach. And then, you know, I, I lived that way for a while, mostly like, you know, when my YouTube videos were really, were really popular. And then more injuries. And I just listened to my body. So it's not like, you know, I just, I'm just listening to my body. I'm just doing what my body tells me to do. Yeah, and the rest I, I just broke my elbow a few months ago overtraining and then doing jujitsu and I probably should have known that and then my elbow <laughs> popped out and I'm like okay <laughs> new method um uh, you, you might you call them demons uh the the drive to do this thing that ultimately hurt you how do you it's almost like a question on intuition how do you differentiate between the voices it's a really good question so number one is is stillness remember I talked about talked about the mind and the mm -hmm. mind having chatter, monkey mind. Uh, a lot of the demons are superficial in that they're just wrong thinking. So, you know, if you're, if you're feeling doubtful about something, it might be your mom's voice. You're, what are you doubtful for? What are you scared about? You, but unconsciously, you hear your mommy saying, oh, be a good boy and don't get injured. Be a nice boy. And it's like that, that voice that's not yours that was like a virus placed into your consciousness, which is okay, you know, no judgment against mommy, no judgments against you for taking that, but understand that it's no longer, it's no longer a resourceful voice that's holding you back. I'm referring to as quote, quote unquote, demon. And so when you're still and you notice these unresourceful voices creeping in, uh, you can create distance, you can objectify it, you could choose not to next time, you could be, so the next time, so for example, you know, uh, you, you, you're afraid to speak to girls. Part of the reason why you're afraid to speak to girls is because you got this voice uh, in the back of your head because of being rejected. And you're still enough to recognize, you know, there's, there's, there's that voice again. You now have the capacity to hear the voice, not attached to it emotionally, which, which drives it deeper into your karma, uh, and do the thing that you fear the most, just do it. And you, all of a sudden that demon, like Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do the thing you fear the most and the death of fear is certain, that demon is dispelled. You could even talk to, that's why I think prayer and incantation and mantra and affirmation is good. You could talk to that demon. You could, you could shout at that demon. You could emotionalize your rejection of that demon and say, get out of here, beta version of me. Get out of here, wrong thinking. Get out of here, Satan. And then do the thing that you fear the most, you see? So it's just a, it's, it's a tool. It's a way of thinking. It's a perspective that's resourceful in beating back all the weaknesses within us. Yeah, I just find like sometimes it's hard. Like, uh, like I just mentioned my injury. There's definitely a voice in me that, yes, knew that, hey, you should probably not overtrain today. Don't push yourself. Uh, you're training later. And then there's also part of me that just wanted to crush the set. And then yeah. I went to an injury. And like... Honestly, the, the demon that got me injured was way louder. <laughs> like, it was way more compelling to listen to that one because it's more fun. Yep. Um, even though I knew it was, I mean, it's like, 
is it is it just a trial and error thing? I mean, now I got the lesson, but obviously it'd be nice. Yes, I broke that. That is an initiation. Every time you do that, you're being initiated by life. You're mm-hmm. you're being sh- think about it. You were injured, humiliating. Being injured is humiliating. You're humbled, and when you're humbled, you become open. And when you're open, you're available to see a new way. So that's experience. That's learning something. So you got to go through those. You know, my dad says it. I can tell you not to touch that stovetop a thousand times, but until you touch it, you won't really know. Burn yourself. You won't really know. So it's resourceful to learn from other people's experiences. I, I, do, I do agree with that. But it, it's also very powerful to make your own mistakes so that you can learn the lesson and transmutate. Is that an approach you take with your kids? I mean, I mean, it's obviously a range where you allow them to get hurt, but do you kind of let them learn their own lessons? Well, in a lot of ways, as a parent, you don't have a choice. Hmm. You've got to teach and set boundaries, but there are certain things you can't make them do. Like, so for example, my daughter, for the past year has chosen to be vegan. And I don't think it's a great idea. That's just me personally. And uh, and we see some of the negative side effects of her being vegan for too long. I don't think it's wrong with it for a little while. But so she's learning that, hmm, when I eat this way, I am depressed, I am anxious, I am ungrounded. And so it is my hope that through that experience and the contrast thereof, that's why I say all of life is an experiment. And I don't think there's anything wrong with experimenting. Yeah, go hard, but remain open and available to see the contrast so that you can learn the lesson because otherwise you're stuck in your own echo chamber. So that's my opinion on that. And I can't force her to eat, but I can be a propaganda machine (laughs) and constantly offer information and an alternative you see, so I, you know, I, yeah, of course, I make her, let her make her own mistake. That's fine. Gotcha. Yeah, well, this has been awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on, Elliot. Um, I know people could probably find you on YouTube, but is there anything that's coming up? Another grounding camp? Any other resources? Yeah, go sure. to groundingcamp.com. Okay. Go to groundingcamp.com where we're making men strong again by bringing back ritual initiation for men. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll be sure to check that out. Yeah, thanks again for coming on. This was great. You got it, Ron. Awesome.